those uh, so for those that don't know me, I'm Lini Maria Walter Thompson Rubinstein. Uh, I come from. I uh, started up the uh, Danish part of the International uh, LaRouche Organization in 1975-76, and uh, this coming week. Uh, I'm celebrating that I came to the shores of the United States 20 years ago. <laughs> and I'm saying that also because uh, in that way I am concerning knowledge about the United States, uh, history, how the United States is functioning and ticking in many different ways. I'm still learning. I don't know uh, very much more than you do, uh, being mostly about 20, regarding having lived in America for 20 years. Okay, I can draw upon experiences from Europe and other work that I've been doing. So I have uh, my uh, right-hand man here, left, or left-hand man here, <laughs> Phil, uh, if there are certain things I cannot answer regarding American history. So um, it's very... Apropos um, regarding what Lynn had to say this morning, what I'm going to go through this afternoon. It's, uh, Lynn, uh, a couple of years ago, said that we had to resume the American Revolution, that it was not won, and that uh, the fight that the founding fathers of the United States launched getting uh, drawn up the Declaration of Independence and after that, the Constitution of the United States. The fight for these ideas is an unfinished fight, which I think all of you know after the outcome of the election this last Tuesday and after what Lynn had to say this morning. And uh, this is what I'm going to touch upon through talking about the um, uh, two two crucial people, in particular Frederick Douglass, uh, but it is impossible to talk about a great American leader like and nobody else because Frederick Douglass was crucial in one of the, after the founding of the United States, the next most important period in the United States was in the period where Frederick Douglass lived. And another giant together with Frederick Douglass was Lincoln. So it is impossible to take a person out in the context of all the other uh, people, and particularly the most important people and events at that time. Uh, I uh, have thought about doing this for a while because last time LaRouche came to the West Coast, uh, we uh, had a dinner with him and he got the question from Robert Beltran, if we were going to write a drama today, uh, a classical drama that would uh, show the history, the best way would show the history of the United States what the United States really represent, what should we take, which people should we take. So it was proposed Lincoln, and then somebody else proposed Martin Luther King, and, he, and uh, LaRouche said, no, no, not Martin Luther King, Frederick Douglass. Lincoln, yes, and then Frederick Douglass, because Martin Luther King, Lynn said, is an echo of uh, Frederick Douglass. So I, ever after that discussion, I've had in my head that although I had read Douglas, uh, Frederick Douglass's autobiography, um, a couple of them, I had to go back and look at it more closely to figure out uh, what uh, Lynn meant with that. And this is what I'm going to do today. So, uh, the ideas that we are fighting for today, and which is at stake, LaRusso said it a number of times recently that the very existence of this nation and the rest of the world is at stake. And I will read you a, a short section from the Declaration of Independence, which you all know, and then the preamble to the U.S. Constitution, which you also all know, but I just kind of wanted to restate it because this is the ideas that we are fighting for internationally, that we are fighting for here in the United States, and this is what was the key fight with uh, Douglas and Lincoln, that they won those ideas back and revived those ideas, which is what we uh, must do today. And the Declaration of Independence says, 
We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. And then the preamble to the Constitution. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. So, these are what shaped the United States. This is what shaped the fight, as I said before, uh, at Lincoln and Douglas's time, and this is the ideas that are defining the fight that we are in today. Um, I will now come with the introduction first. Oh, okay. You probably all, being Americans, know this picture. This is the second house where Lincoln grew up in. Lincoln and Douglas came from very different parts of the country. Lincoln came from Kentucky. Uh, they were not rich. He didn't have a lot of schooling. And this was the second house he lived in. Uh, Kentucky was a slave state, but there was not a lot of black people there. And then the other crucial person who I'm going to concentrate most about is Frederick Douglass. He, he is, as a young man, um, he uh, was born a slave in Maryland, in Talbot County. And they are more or less the same time. Lincoln is uh, eight or nine years older, but they are more or less uh, the same generation. And um, Douglas didn't know who was his father. The rumors went at the, um, at the place where he was that he was the master. And, um, but he could never ask his mother because what was usual was to take the children when they were small away from their mothers so they could not have any close uh, connection to their, to their uh, family and get uh, in particular to the mother. So uh, Douglas never got to ask his mother because uh, uh, he would only see her now and then. She was living 12 miles away from where he was. And then now and then she would walk the 12 miles after, end, after she had finished working in the day and then sleep with him for a couple of hours in, together with him and then walk back uh, to where she lived 12 miles away. But she had to be up and ready before sunset. So she would always be gone when, uh, when he woke up in the morning. And this only happened a few times. One of the, um, there's a few, I'm not going to dwell very much about the 21 years that uh, Douglas was in slavery, but some few things to put a, a good image about where he comes from. So I'm going to take up a couple of things that really shaped him and, and uh, made a big impression for him that would last throughout his life. And what he describes was that when he was a little kid, about five or six years old, uh, his aunt would get a horrible treatment. His aunt was the most beautiful uh, woman on the plantation, and um, the master had said that she was not allowed uh, to leave the plantation without his uh, knowledge and in particular that he would not like, her, uh, like to see her ever with her boyfriend, Ned. So uh, the aunt goes out with her uh, loved one, Ned, is being discovered, and this is what uh, the little Douglas experiences when he's about five or six years old. <coughs> Before he commenced whipping on Hester, he took her into the kitchen and stripped her from neck to waist, leaving her neck, shoulders, and back entirely naked. 
He then told her to cross her hands, calling her at the same time a damned bitch. After crossing her hands, he tied them with a strong rope and led her to a stool under a large hook in the joist put in for the purpose. He made her get upon the stool and tied her hands to the hook. She now stood fair for his internal purpose. Her arms were stretched up at their full length, so that she stood upon the ends of her toes. He then said to her, Now, you damned bitch, I'll learn you how to disobey my orders. And after rolling up his sleeves, he commenced to lay on the heavy cow skin, and soon the warm, red blood, amid heart-rendering shrieks from her and horrid oaths from him, came dripping to the floor. I was so terrified and horror-stricken at the sight that I hid myself in a closet and dared not venture out till long after the bloody transaction was over. I expected it would be my turn next. It was all new to me. So as you'd say that this never left him ever in the rest of his life, that first experience of witnessing that. Then when he is six or, six or seven years old, he really doesn't know how old he is, whether he was born in 1817 or 1818. But about when he is six or seven years old, he's being sent by his master to, to serve another master in Baltimore. And he says afterwards that uh, because he uh, had this opportunity, he thought that God had looked after him. Because uh, he had this opportunity to go to Baltimore, that laid the foundation for him later on uh, escaping slavery and live the life he did. Uh, a very, very important uh, uh, event happens in Baltimore. His, the mistress there teaches him she has never had anything to do with slaves. This is her first slave, this little boy. And what uh, she does is she teaches him to read. And he has already learned the alphabet and uh, three, four letters. And then it is being discovered by her husband, the master. And here is what transpired. If you give a nigger an inch, he will take an L. A nigger should know nothing but to obey his master, to do as he is told to do. Learning would spoil the best nigger in the world. Now, if you teach that nigger how to read, there would be no keeping him. It would forever unfit him to be a slave. He would at once become unmanageable and of no value to his master. As to himself, it could do him no good, but a great deal of harm. It would make him discontent and unhappy. These words sank deep into my heart, stirred up sentiments within that lay slumbering, and called into existence an entirely new train of thought. It was a new and special revelation explaining dark and mysterious things with which my youthful understanding had struggled, but struggled in vain. I now understood what had been to me a most perplexing difficulty, to wit, the white man's power to enslave the black man. It was a grand achievement, and I prized it highly. From that moment... I understood the pathway from slavery to freedom. It was just what I wanted, and I got it at a time when I least expected it. And guess what he does? He uh, figures out all kinds of ways in, in, uh, in uh, how to uh, continue to progress, both with reading but also writing. He, uh, find, uh, he uh, acquaints himself, gets good friends with white boys in the neighborhood, and then it teaches him he will bring bread from the house and give them the bread and get lessons from the street. And the motivation that he now has learned, okay, the road, the, the, this is not what they want, this is what they don't want me to do. This is the road to freedom. So the motivation was very strong. And when you later, when, when you uh, read Douglas's writings, his speeches and his articles, he has a fantastic language. He uh, really got to, I had to look up when I was, I've been reading all his writings uh, in the last weeks, and I often had to use the dictionary uh, to figure out words that I uh, had never uh, bumped into before. So, uh, so he's learning to read and to write. Then when he's 15, he's sent back to Maryland, or Baltimore's Maryland too, but he's sent back into the plantation. And he's a smart guy, he's strong, and he has learned to read and write. And you can see that in a person's face, that he was not a brute. Uh, and uh, therefore, he is very soon uh, sent to a slave breaker, a very famous slave breaker, Covey, that could break any slave and make him 
forget about that he was a human, that he was a man. So the first uh, six months, um, uh, Dorcas is being whipped more or less on a daily basis. Uh, just jump over the next one. And um, uh, there's w one time where he is uh, being whipped for hours and then he runs away. He runs back to his old master and say, look, you have to really help me. He's covered in blood from top to toe. And he describes how his back, there is ripples so deep that you could put your finger into them, like the back of this man. And the master say, no, you have to go back to Kobe. You have one year contract, you have to go back to him. So he goes back, there's certain things that happens, and uh, when it's, uh, it's, it happens to be when he comes back, it is Sunday morning. And Kobe, the slave breaker, is very, very religious. So he's, pray he's praying every day, morning, noon, and night. And um, Sunday, he's extra pious. So nothing happens. Sunday, uh, but then the next day, uh, Doctor sees a, a glint in Kobe's eyes, and indeed Kobe is uh, ready to give him the whipping of his life. And what Douglas does, which has a major impact upon him, is that he decides to fight Kobe. So for two hours, they fight it out and Frederick Douglass wins the fight. He literally grabs the guy and there is a knockout, drag out fight. And after that, Kobe, for the next half year, where he still is at this house, never puts a lazy hand on Frederick Douglass again. Um, I want to have Freddie uh, read two sections. He was actually supposed to read it earlier, my fault again around scenes from that time in the United States regarding slavery and then we will leave that chapter but I would like, I would like to have it in your back of your head as we proceed uh, today. Some of the most awful scenes of cruelty are constantly taking place in the middle states of the Union. We have in those states what are called the slave breeding states. Allow me to speak plainly. Although it is harrowing to your feeling, it is necessary that the facts of the case should be stated. We have in the United States slave breeding states. The very state from which the minister from our court to yours comes is one of these states, Maryland, where men, women, and children are reared for the market just as horses, sheep, and swine are raised for the market. Slave rearing there is looked upon as a legitimate trade. The law sanctions it. Public opinion upholds it. The church does not condemn it. It goes on in all its bloody horrors, sustained by the auctioneer's block. If you would see the cruelties of this system, hear the following narrative. Not long since the following scene occurred. A slave woman and a slave man had united themselves as man and wife in the absence of any law to protect them as man and wife. They had lived together by the permission, not by right, of their master, and they had reared a family. The master found it expedient, and for his interest, to sell them. He did not ask them their wishes in regard to the matter at all. They were not consulted. The man and woman were brought to the auctioneer's block under the sound of the hammer. The cry was raised, Here goes, who bids cash? Think of it, a man and wife to be sold. The woman was placed on the auctioneer's block. Her limbs, as is customary, were brutally exposed to the purchasers, who examined her with all the freedom with which they would examine a horse. There stood the husband powerless, no right to his wife, the master's right preeminent. She was sold. He was next brought to the auctioneer's block. His eyes followed his wife in the distance, and he looked beseechingly, imploringly to the man that had, brought, that had bought his wife to buy him also. But he was at length bit off to another person. He was about to be separated forever from her whom he loved. No word of his, no work of his could save him from this separation. He asked permission of his new master to go and take the hand of his wife at parting. It was denied him. 
In the agony of his soul, he rushed from the man who had just bought him that he might take a farewell of his wife. But his way was obstructed. He was struck over the head with a loaded whip and was held for a moment. But his agony was too great. When he was let go, he fell a corpse at the feet of his master. His heart was broken. Such scenes are the everyday fruits of American slavery. Some two years since, the Honorable Seth M. Gates, an anti-slavery gentleman of the state of New York, a representative in the Congress of the United States, told me he saw with his own eyes the following circumstance. In the National District of Columbia, over which the star-spangled emblem is constantly waving, where orators are ever holding forth on the subject of American liberty, American democracy, American republicanism, there are two slave prisons. When going across a bridge leading to one of these prisons, he saw a young woman run out barefooted and bareheaded and with very little clothing on. She was running with all speed to the bridge he was approaching. His eye was fixed upon her and he stopped to see what was the matter. He had not paused long before he saw three men run out after her. He now knew what the nature of the case was. A slave escaping from her chains, a young woman, a sister, escaping from the bondage in which she had been held. She made her way to the bridge, but not reached it. Ere from the Virginia side, there came two slaveholders. As soon as they saw them, her pursuers called out, Stop her! True to their Virginian instincts, they came to the rescue of their brother kidnappers across the bridge. The poor girl now saw that there was no chance for her. It was a trying time. She knew if she went back, she must, be a, she must be a slave forever. She must be dragged down to the scenes of pollution which the slaveholders continually provide for most of the poor, sinking, wretched young women whom they call their property. She formed a resolution. And just as those who were about to take her were going to put hands upon her to drag her back, she leapt over the balustrades of the bridge and down she went to rise no more. She chose death rather than to go back into the hands of those Christian slaveholders from whom she had escaped. Skip the next one with the lashes. So um, there's one aspect of this uh, that is the physical aspect, yes, but there's another aspect that is much more devastating. And I will now let Douglas speak on his own again regarding that. Douglas? <laughs> there is still a deeper shade to be given to this picture. The physical cruelties are indeed sufficiently harassing and revolting but they are but as a few grains of sand on the seashore or a few drops of water in the great ocean compared with the stupendous wrongs which it inflicts upon the mental, moral, and religious nature of its hapless victims. It is only when we contemplate the slave as a moral and intellectual being that we can adequately comprehend the unparalleled enormity of slavery and the intense criminality of the slaveholder. I have said that slave is a man. What a piece of work is man. How noble in reason. How infinite in faculties. In form and moving, how express and admirable. In action, how like an angel. In apprehension, how like a god. The beauty of the world, the paragon of animals. The slave is a man, the image of God, but a little lower than the angels, possessing a soul eternal and indestructible capable of endless happiness or immeasurable woe, a creature of hopes and fears, of affections and passions, of joys and sorrows. And he is endowed with those mysterious powers by which man soars above the things of time and sense and grasps with undying tenacity the elevating and sublimely glorious idea of a god. It is such a being that is smitten and blasted. The first work of slavery is to mar and deface those characteristics of its victims which distinguish men from things and persons from property. So, um, 
I will not talk very much about more about these first 21 years. Suffice it to say, he tries to escape, it doesn't function. He's actually teaching 40 students for a year, uh, and uh, is, he escapes north. Um, and after I worked for three years as a uh, chalker, is it called a chalker? Chalker? Okay. Uh, he is being discovered by the abolitionist uh, movement, the people that are working to abolish slavery. And uh, they organize him to become one of their organizers, to, run, to go around from city to city to speak against slavery. One of the key people that gets hold of him is this gentleman uh, by the name of Garrison. Uh, Garrison is absolutely against the U.S. Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. He says that this is evil, that the Constitution was written for promoting and keeping slavery, and therefore it is evil and should be gotten rid of, and the Union of the United States should be destroyed. So when Douglas is a young man, just comes out of slavery, he uh, believes that this is so. And he gives one, he's a real organizer, he gives one fiery speech after the other. And uh, he develops extremely fast so that uh, the, the white abolitionists tell him, you cannot talk like that because nobody will believe that you have been a slave. I mean, they think you are a fake. And um, uh, so then, because they say, he's already beginning to be told that he's a fake, that he's not a real slave, that uh, then he writes, can I get the narrative? Then he, writes, then he writes the first autobiography, he writes three of them, a narrative to uh, explain, uh, uh, and he will give all the names of his masters and, and so forth so in order to, to not only prove that he is a slave, but also to educate people about what is the situation in the South. Because in the North, most people had no idea uh, because of propaganda where the slaveholders will say we take so good care of our slaves they're much better off with us than if they were on their own and so forth so this is a major tool for organizing as well but this means that, that uh, he's uh, is now in danger of being taken back to slavery and therefore he goes for almost one year to Scotland, Ireland and uh, England and organizes over there um, and his friends that he gets over there buys him his freedom and he comes back to the United States. So this is like where he is a young man. Uh, he says uh, regarding, can I get a little bit of a light? Um, he says that regarding America, this is when he's young, is this, uh, here he is 28. If ever I had any patriotism or any capacity for the feeling, it was whipped out of me long since by the lash of the American soul drivers. And, and same years he says, I have not, I cannot have any love for this country as such or for its constitution. Um, I mean, he, it's a speech after speech. So I'm just giving you little tidbits. The Constitution is pro-slavery. It is the most foul and bloody conspiracy against the rights of three million slaved, enslaved and uh, imbruted men. And he calls for the destruction of the Union, and he says, don't be political. Don't use the ballot to change anything. The only thing that counts is moral persuasion. It's all what comes particularly around this guy, Garrison. So, um, next. In, uh, in 47, the end of 47, he begins a paper called The North Star. And I think most of you know that the reason for the North, calling the North Star, is this is what the slaves would uh, follow the North Star on their way to get to freedom. So he called the, uh, the paper that he started in Rochester in upstate New York, he called it The North Star. And on its masthead, yes, There was Douglas, yeah. Um, 
And on the masthead of this paper, the North Star, it says, Right is of no sex. Truth is of no color. God is the father of us all, and we are all brethren. This paper can, came to play a really crucial role. So it starts in 1847, and it goes on for 16 years. So it, it lasts until in the middle of the Civil War. So it's, a very, it's an organizing tool, in particular for the black population, but increasingly it becomes the paper that uh, people in the know reads. So, and he is an organizer, uh, Douglas. He, he uh, writes for, the, for this paper, he writes for other papers, he uh, untiringly go out to one meeting after the other, to, and these are large meetings, 2,000 people, 3,000 people, to speak uh, against slavery. And he, uh, I mean, one thing that he is extremely upset about, uh, it's not even the right words to use, is the question about uh, the, the uh, prohibition for slaves to learn to read and be completely taken away from any education. Where, I mean, for example, in Louisiana, if a mother taught her child to read, she could be hanged. In Alabama, if you were taken for the third offense of teaching a slave to read, death. Louisiana, second offense. Uh, South Carolina also, third offense, death. And as Douglas says, I have found that to make a contented slave, it is necessary to make a thoughtless one. Uh, for a nation to cramp and circumscribe the mental faculties of a class of its inhabitants, it uh, is as unwise as it is cruel, since it, in the same proportion, sacrifices its power and happiness. Very, very similar today, uh, for today, where there has been a conscious effort escalating in order to make people stupid, uh, so that uh, people might not know that they are controlled, and they are content, uh, and this is how you can take over a nation from within without firing a shot. And this is being done, it was done consciously at, at Darkness' time with the slaves, and it's done consciously today for the same purpose. Another area which he is very sharp, and I'm just giving you tidbits because, I mean, there's uh, uh, 2,000 pages of his writings and speeches. He was very industrious. He uh, was very angry with the church. This is not even also the right words, and the religion. Uh, and he said, when he first escaped slavery, he said, if I ever come back to slavery, then there is one master I don't want, and that is a religious master, that the worst one uh, of the masters in the South were the religious ones. <laughs> and uh, he said, the church of America is beyond all question the chief refuse of slavery. Slavery finds no champions so bold as the ministers of religion. In his first narrative, and I don't know if he wrote it himself or he picked it up somewhere, but he has this in the very end of this, uh, this first autobiography, he has a parody on the church. And I'll just read you four verses out of, I don't know, 18 or 20. Come, saints and sinners, hear me tell how pious priests whip Jack and Nell, and women buy and children sell, and preach all sinners down to hell, and sing of heavenly union. Um, they'll crack old Tony on the skull, and preach and roar like bash and bull, bull, or braying ass of mischief full. Then seize old Jacob by the wool, and pull for heavenly union. Love not the world, the preacher said, and winked his eye and shook his head. He seized on Tom and Dick and Ned, cut short their meat and clothes and bread, yet still loved heavenly union. Another preacher whining spoke of one whose heart for sinners broke. He tied, he tied old nanny to an oak and drew the blood at every stroke and prayed for heavenly union. 
Two others opened their iron jaws and waved their children stealing paws. They set their children in gugors by stinting Negroes back and moors. They kept up heavenly union. And many verses. He really um, thinks that the church, very, very similar to what we just, uh, the church at Douglas' time played the role that we just have seen in the United States with uh, Christian fundamentalism plays in the United States as extreme destructive element. One thing that is interesting, and I don't know the story, I just know there was a fantastic change, is that Douglas describes how the Methodist Church and the Baptist Church and the Presbyterian Church, but led by the Methodist Church, they all, by the end of the 18th century, they were all against slavery and very explicit. So, for example, to give you, uh, you have in 1780, the Methodist Church has a conference where they acknowledge that slavery is contrary to the laws of God, man and nature, and hurtful to society. Uh, this conference concludes slavery is contrary to the dictates of conscience and to true religion and doing to others that what we would not, uh, they should do to us. Then the same church, 1784, they have, they have again a conference and they state, and this is kind of written up and sent out as a directive to the church members, those who buy, sell, or give slaves away, except for the purpose of freeing them, shall be expelled from the church immediately. And then in 1801, the same church, the same church says that we declare that we are more than ever convinced of the great evil of African slavery, which still exists in these United States. And every member of the society who sells as slaves shall immediately, on full proof, be excluded from the society. The conferences are directed to draw up addresses for the gradual emancipation for the slaves to the legislatures. To the legislatures. Proper committees shall be appointed out of the most respectable of our friends for the conducting of this business. And the presiding elders, deacons, and traveling preachers shall do all in their power to further the blessed undertaking. Let this be continued from year to year till the desired end be accomplished. That is the Methodist Church. Then what you have is a complete change. So this was 1801. Then you have a complete change in all the churches, Methodist, um, uh, Episcopalian, uh, Presbyterian, and so forth. 1836, it's just 35 years, and uh, where the Methodist Church states in 1836 that they, at their annual conference, it's all written down and so forth, decidedly op opposed to modern abolitionism and wholly, wholly disclaim any right, wish, or intention to interfere in the civil and political relation between master and slave as it exists in, this, in the states of this union. And uh, so you had a, in those 35 years, you had a big takeover, consciously done. I don't know what, uh, exactly how this was functioning, but uh, it was clearly done in order to strengthen the power of the, uh, of the slaveholders. And Douglas and others at this time said this was crucial that the church uh, became the main defender and promoter of slavery in the name of God. So <clears throat> now I, I come to a very, very important period. I, uh, uh, next to the founding of the United States, uh, one of the most important periods in the history of the United States, comparable to today, and that's the period between 1850 and 1860. And this is in the period where Frederick Douglass and Lincoln's paths begin to merge. And again, I, I'm, it, I'm kind of, there's a lot of things I'm not going to take up. Um, I intend to do some more classes with all the 
sections and areas that I'm not, I'm not taking up today. So I'm, I'm kind of going quickly through some very, very important things. But we have between 1850 and 1860, you have 50,000 slaves are escaping from the south. A uh, huge uh, increase in those 10 years. You also have in 1850 a law called the Fugitive Slave Law, which meant that before when a slave like Frederick Douglass earlier, when you had come up um, uh, north of the Mason-Dixon line, then you were somewhat safe. With the fugitive slave law, uh, this was not any longer the case. And um, they had made it, uh, now it was okay for slaveholders in the south to send up slave catchers to the north to uh, bring back fugitive slaves. But they could bring back anybody because, uh, him go. because um, there would be no trial or hearing. That is, if you find some guy, a uh, black guy in the streets, you can just take him. There will be no trial, no hearing. Uh, and uh, so that the so-called fugitive were not allowed to present ev any evidence that you were a free man and so forth. And um, if it was so, it, and also the slave owner was authorized to use all reasonable force necessary to take a fugitive back to the place of his or her escape. And what you had was, if you, if you thought that if you were a good person in the North that held a fugitive slave uh, to hide or to then further escape, then you would be fined with $100. Um, also, if a slave ran away, let's say you were a sheriff or something, and a slave ran away from your holding, then you would be liable for the full value, so to speak, of that human being. And if you had caught some slave or some fugitive and you uh, turned him in as a fugitive slave, then you got 10 bucks. If it was so that you said, no, he's not a fugitive slave, you only got $5. So that was all kind of, so basically anybody could be picked up and sent back uh, south to slavery. Next. One of my very good friends, uh, Harriet Tubman, was very vigilant, the Moses of her people. She could not read and write, uh, but was very potent in her own way, and uh, Douglas admired her greatly. This was her in, in between 18, she escaped slavery in 48, and between 1850 and 1860, she was the most famous conductor on the Underground Railroad, because she would go down again and again in the middle of the slavery, in the south, and lead slaves to freedom in the north. She was so efficient in stealing the property from the slaveholders that there was a, a reward out of her head, dead or alive, of $40,000. This is a lot of money in the 1850s, okay? This shows you uh, the potency and how freaked out and pissed off those slaveholders were about uh, this uh, lady. She was only five feet tall, uh, but it's not in the size. Uh, so, and uh, after the fugitive slave law, there was more money now. It was like the slavery was kind of sending up its arms, its ugly arms up into the north. And, um, uh, yes? Yes. Like yes. Like yes. 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 Actually, it's more of a gunpoint in the way that she was famous for. She had this big skirt. Well, I guess most women had that at that time. Um, and uh, she would have a big gun under her skirt because often when people, when uh, people got scared, then they wanted to come back, go back, run back, and then she would pull out her gun and said, 
you are a, a, a dead or you come with me. So, uh, tough lady, tough lady. She actually later on, uh, because she was black and because she knew the terrain, so to speak, uh, she became one of the key spies for Lincoln during the Civil War. Um, next. So the slaveholders' hands are stretching into the north. And this is uh, actually from the place where Lincoln came from. This is 53. And you can see this is this gentleman, Talbot, who, wants, who says for number one young man, I'll pay 1200 to 1250 and for women, 850 to 1000 and I'm the one who pays the most. This is 53. Uh, there was a lot of, I have a lot of other advertisements where it was massively increased and more and more open concerning um, uh, uh, trading. So, um, another thing, actually with this fugitive slave law, which Harriet Tubman played a big role in also, was to take people up to Canada. So in those 10 years out of the 50,000 that fled from uh, the South, 20,000 of them were taken all the way to Canada, and Harriet Tubman took a lot of them to Canada. Uh, Douglas, Frederick Douglass' house in Rochester also had a lot of fugitives stopping by there and continuing on their way to, to Canada. <coughs> it is very important to set also the, uh, to create the conditions for the Civil War that follows in 1860 that you have this big, big push of slaves uh, uh, escaping to the north. Then uh, one thing that Douglas also points out again and again is a great turn com uh, com combined with all this uh, was the Great Compromise of 1850, where California would remain a non-slave state, Texas would be okay to be a slave state, and then it was up to Utah or New Mexico, whatever they wanted to do. It had earlier been made so, it was in the 1830s, that if a state wanted to join the Union, then they couldn't be a slave state. But this was now gotten rid of. So it's like it's really uh, sending out its claws, this evil uh, monster up to the north. Uh, so uh, importantly also now, uh, Frederick Douglass is maturing, and he's a, he's a sharp guy. And uh, he becomes convinced, it takes him a couple of years, but he becomes convinced that Garrison and these guys are wrong, that the, con the American Constitution is great, that the Declaration of Independence is great, that this is the greatest instrument that can be used uh, for getting rid of slavery. And Frederick Douglass comes out with that publicly. And don't forget, he has his own press. He is a, he's a very thoughtful speaker. It's told of him he has this booming baritone voice. And you saw his face before. He's quite a character. And his booming baritone voice uh, and very eloquent and very committed uh, person. So, and he has his paper. So when he comes out as the leading spokesman against slavery, in, 19, in 1851 and says, I have changed my mind. I think that, uh, the, um, uh, that from the very adoption of the U.S. Constitution until now, it is not and never has been a pro-slavery instrument. And he says, a thing that LaRouche has said many times, he said, the preamble, what I read in the beginning, the preamble of the Constitution are governing the meaning of the document in all its parts and details. And he will then, in longer essays, describe um, how this is the case. And he says, yes, uh, 51. And he says, therefore, and very important, therefore, political action to secure the eradication of slavery is both warranted and necessary. And he insists that the Constitution be wielded on behalf of the emancipation and use the ballots, be political. So, uh, and again, this is just, this is like a little tidbit out of a number of speeches and a number of articles where he argues 
why this is the case. And if some of you want to study it more, I can tell you exactly where to go and where to look at it. Because it is, it, the, this evil institution of slavery had been used by the slaveholders. Uh, you said you had the church, God says that the black man is inferior, and you had the con American Constitution says uh, that uh, 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 you should have slavery and, and so forth, and they have all these uh, interpretation like the, uh, like the preachers had that interpretation of the Bible. So, um, so this obviously is extremely important. That's why I'm saying Lincoln and Douglas begins to emerge past uh, uh, because also Lincoln had, Lincoln never liked slavery, but he was not, it was not the first thing on his mind. And um, he thought for also in this period, maybe we can send all the black people in America, maybe we can send them to Liberia, maybe we can send them to some place. And actually, later on, there's a made an experiment with sending black people away, and it doesn't function. Douglas is very angry about that. So they have battles. Lincoln and Douglas, they battle. Uh, but they also, they, uh, they are both gigantic characters. They are characters that LaRouche talked about this morning. Each one of them, both of them, concerning taking responsibility for the country as a whole, as commander-in-chief. And so they listen to each other. You have all the time when you read Lincoln and you read Douglas, you can see how it's not so that it, Douglas can be so scaly in his attacks. Lincoln doesn't get offended or, or Nora and so forth. No, he listens and, and so forth. So Lincoln changes in this period and Douglas changes in this period. So you have, um, what you have merging is that Douglas becomes to get out to one, it becomes one of the most uh, eloquent and potent organizers for the Union and for the Constitution of the United States. And Lincoln ends up, as you'll see, to realize that uh, the fight for the Union is a fight against slavery. Um, educating each other and the times are educating them also because they do take responsibility each one of them for the country as a whole as a commander in chief so um, uh, uh, Steve Douglas not our Steve Douglas uh, the Steve Douglas there was a senator uh, Stephen Douglas okay well uh, he um, uh, is a real racist uh, son of a gun. And uh, Frederick Douglass has some really wonderful, I'm not going to go into it, but he has some really wonderful scathing attacks on uh, Steve Douglass. And um, I would like Freddie to read a section from this from um, page 329. This is in one of these uh, speeches. <clears throat> the growth of intelligence, the influence of commerce, steam, wind, and lightning are our allies. It would be easy to amplify this summary and to swell the vast conglomeration of our material forces, but there is a deeper and truer method of measuring the power of our cause and of comprehending its vitality. This is to be found in its accordance with the best elements of human nature. It is beyond the power of slavery to annihilate affinities recognized and established by the Almighty. The slave is bound to mankind by the powerful and inextricable network of human brotherhood. His voice is the voice of a man, and his cry is the cry of a man in distress. And man must cease to be man before he can become insensible to that cry. It is the righteousness of the cause, the humanity of the cause, which constitutes its potency. And in this refutation of Steve Douglas also, um, uh, uh, Frederick Douglas says that uh, some things are settled not by the laws of man, but by the laws of God. I mean, in the same uh, thought that uh, Freddie just read. Liberty and slavery cannot dwell in the United States in peaceful relations. The South must either give up slavery or the North must give up liberty. I repeat, the South must either give up slavery 
or the North must give up liberty. There is not a single tendency of slavery, but it is adverse to freedom. This is 1854. Well, two years later, Lincoln would say more or less the same thing in uh, one of these famous seven debates he had with the same man, Steve Douglas, where Lincoln would say, so Douglas had said the South must either give up slavery or the North must give up liberty, and you heard the other things. And here is Lincoln two years later in a debate with the same man. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall, but I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. Um, so, yeah, okay, I'm not used to this thing here. Uh, these are the debates where they're straight up from where uh, that. And let's get a picture of this little guy, Stephen Douglas. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, next, next. Uh, we are still in this period, uh, 1850 to 1860, and this is Dred Scott, and so you have a constant escalation of, on behalf of the slave owners, re uh, becoming more and more atrocious. And um, the, the, the Dred Scott decision was uh, that a, a guy called uh, Dred had uh, lived in a non-slave area with his master. Then when his master died, he moved around. But then he, when his master died, he was uh, sold. And he uh, then sued and said, I'm free. I've lived in an area where uh, there's not allowance to have, to have slavery. And there was a decision by the uh, Rehnquist at that time called Taney, it's exactly the same ideas. It is exactly the same attitude towards mankind and towards the Constitution at that time and as we have today. Same thing. And what Taney argued was that uh, the, um, from the Supreme Court that uh, the Missouri Cred uh, Circuit Court had no jurisdiction over the case um, since uh, Dred Scott were not and could never be citizens within the meaning of the Constitution and therefore had no right to sue in federal court. Uh, the Supreme Judge uh, Taney, Rehnquist, Rehnquist Taney we can call him, argued that when the Constitution was adopted, Negroes were regarded as persons of an inferior order and not as citizens, and they were not intended to be included by the Constitution provision given to citizens of different states the right to sue in federal court. And um, also other things that he, he ruled, other things that he didn't have to do. This was a major escalation. And listen to that. Uh, uh, Douglas' response was, in a meeting he, they, uh, they had immediately after, he said, we should be cheerful. Um, this, uh, such a decision cannot stand. God will, God will be true, though every man be a liar. Therefore, although this is a monstrous uh, decision, uh, this very attempt to blot out forever the hopes of an enslaved people may be one necessary link into the chain of events pre uh, uh, pre preparatory to the downfall of this evil slavery system. I thought about this uh, this morning when Lynn talked and said that we have to go out and cause uh, and uh, uh, be agents for, uh, for the sublime because Douglas, uh, what Lynn expressed this morning, Douglas expressed the same thing in what he's just saying. It's horrifying what's going on. 
And Dart has said, well, it cannot go on forever. It's against natural law. And uh, maybe it is a necessary part in the, in the chain of events that will lead to change when you fight. Uh, so I would like uh, Freddie to, uh, you can see a further development of how Frederick Douglass thinks about America, this book, 350. I base my sense of the certain overthrow of slavery in part upon the nature of the American government, the Constitution, the tendencies of the age, and the character of the American people, and this notwithstanding the important decision of Judge Taney. I know of no soil better adapted to the growth of reform than American soil. I know of no country where the conditions for effecting great changes in the settled order of things for the development of right ideas of liberty and humanity are more favorable than here in these United States. The very groundwork of this government is a good repository of Christian civilization. The Constitution, as well as the Declaration of Independence and the sentiments of the founders of the Republic give us a platform broad enough and strong enough to support the most comprehensive plans for the freedom and elevation of all the people of this country without regard to color, class, or clime. Um, so, Lincoln is now nominated for presidential candidate for the, um, uh, for the Republican Party. And the newspapers are full, and he's just, uh, I forget if they call him, a wood splitter. And this is like a total accident or incident, and it was just like that was not, this just like, just kind of happened. Uh, and uh, and right. Douglas, yeah, that you should see, I saw some of the clippings. I mean, there, it's just kind of happened, almost as if it was a lottery. And he's a nobody, non-existent, and so forth. So, uh, Douglas... Uh, is of a total other view. I mean, his view is uh, completely opposite of everything else that comes out, and he writes about what he thinks in uh, the North Star about Lincoln's nomination. He says, just a few lines, so this is much more, Mr. Lincoln is a man of un unblemished private character, great firmness of will, is perseveringly industrious, and one of those most frank, honest men in political life. And Douglas is also very clear about uh, the importance of this election in the Times. He says there's not an event more important since the founding of the nation than this election. Um, so uh, Lincoln is elected. Can we get a picture? Whoops. And um, Douglas and all people uh, in, uh, in the North, of course, but also uh, particularly among the blacks in the South are extremely excited that Lincoln has been elected. And Douglas says, for 50 years the country has taken the law from the lips of an exacting, haughty, and imperious slave oligarchy. The masters of the slave have been masters of the republic. Mr. Lincoln's election breaks this enchantment, dispels this terrible nightmare, and awakens the nation for the consciousness of new powers and the possibility of a higher destiny than the perpetual bondage to an ignoble fear. So, as you all know here, as Lincoln prepares to leave Springfield, Illinois, where he has lived for 25 years, uh, and go to Washington, D.C. At the same time, Jefferson Davis, can we get there? Jefferson Davis is leaving his home to go to Montgomery, Alabama to become the president of the Confederacy. And I will um, read for you what uh, he has to say. So 
you remember the quote, this cannot be half slave, half free from uh, Lincoln when he debated Steve, uh, Stephen Douglas. Well, here is in his own words what Jefferson Davis says. Um, the presidency, president of the Confederacy. He says, the, our new government is founded upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery, subordination to the superior race, is his natural and moral condition. This, our new government, is the first in history of the world based upon this clear, oh, I'm sorry, based upon this great physical, philosophical, and moral truth. That is one of the first days in Montgomery, Alabama, from Jefferson Davis' own lips about why they had founded the Confederate States. Next. And this is not too clear, but you can see these are the people, or the people, these are the slaveholding state, states that seceded. These states did not want to secede, but there were coups which then forced them to secede. Uh, and then you have uh, these states were slaveholding states, but they wanted to stay with the Union and stay with Lincoln with the country. Next. And here is, you can see the orange are uh, no slavery, the green are the slave states, and then you have the blue ones being the border states, and all the white are the territory, the territories, so to speak, they have not been member of the union yet. Next. And this is the election and keep that in your mind. I'm going to show you a map of the election last uh, Tuesday. Uh, just look at the states um, and uh, have, it, have the map in your head and uh, I'll proceed. Let's just see here. Okay, just keep it there. We can just keep it there so people can get a good sense of it. Yeah. Um, so Douglas and others but Douglas was very emphatic that we are going to have a civil war again you cannot uh, this is escalating so much that uh, uh, slavery has to be gotten rid of it cannot, uh, it cannot continue to exist and um, in, uh, after the, f the fall of the Fort Sumter in April uh, 61 in uh, South Carolina, uh, Douglas exclaims, God be praised. He said, the cannons booming over Charleston has compelled everyone to elect between patriotic fidelity and pro-slavery treason. And he's very, it's before this happened, there was a lot of opposition to Douglas because he was very outspoken. So people said he's too much. Uh, why do you link the question about slavery and the question about the, the existence of the Union to each other? You shouldn't do that. But after the fall of Fort Sumter, the uh, people's view of what Douglas has been talking about and writing about changes. And they begin to see, wow, he was right. This is exactly what he's been talking about and this is what we now have on our hands and the two fights go together, the fight for the Union and the fight against slavery. And uh, uh, Douglas didn't care. I mean, most of the uh, uprising in the North to defend the Union uh, against the decession, uh, uh, they didn't refer very much to slavery. But Douglas said, I don't care because this is what uh, will be the outcome. This is uh, where we will go. So this is important. We should mobilize. And he has two, he said, we should go fully out and fight like crazy to the bitter end. And now you get completely obsessed with two things. One thing is um, for the slaves to uh, be, um, be free so they can be used as a war measure. That is, uh, just get them uh, to run into the, uh, later on to the Union lines, 
get them, use them, and so forth. And then in the north, he wants to enlist uh, the black uh, men in the north for the Union Army. And he's being told, no, uh, this is not going to happen. So uh, Douglas is organizing and organizing. He actually later on says maybe it was not so smart at that time to do it. Lincoln was probably right. But at that time, he is very uh, uh, pushing that this has to happen now. And uh, he's organizing speeches, writings, nonstop. As he says, I'm an American citizen in birth, in sentiment, in ideas, in hopes, in aspirations, and responsibilities. And he means that saying also that's why I, as a black man, should, and my fellow should be allowed to fight uh, for the sake of the Union and for freeing slavery. Uh, 1862, very important, Lincoln sends out a proclamation that there is no slavery anymore in Washington, D.C., the capital um, uh, of the United States. And Douglas answers him, time and practice will improve the president as they improve all, uh, other men. He is tall and strong, but he is not done growing. He grows as the nation grows. And so did Douglas himself, right? Um, we have a real scumbag that uh, most of you probably have heard about, Mac McClellan. Can I have the next one? He later on will run for president um, for the Democrats. That is, the Democrats and Republicans at that time was like shifted. Uh, so the Democrats were for slavery, a lot of them, or just for not being wishy-washy. So this is McClellan. And he is a commander. He has 220 or 250,000 troops over his command, and he does nothing for six months. He also, the, the slaves have been told through the grapevine that uh, when Lincoln wins, when the Union Army wins, they are going to be free. And they're fleeing uh, to the Union lines and so forth. And whenever they flee, uh, and um, McClellan is around, they're, going to be st they're being sent back to slavery. There's also a whole battle because the soldiers in McClellan's army are forced to drink muddy water from some of the rivers and so forth because he does not like to take the pure water of General Lee's well. So he's keeping that so General Lee can have his clear, pure water. And... Uh, the soldiers in McClellan's army are forbidden to sing anti-slavery songs. It's just, just a whole... But the worst thing is that he doesn't do anything. He's just like really sitting like uh, an impotent smug. Uh, what um, what uh, Douglas says to Lincoln is that he's either a cold-blooded traitor or an unmitigated military imposter. And Douglas was right. He was a traitor. Um, just trying to prolong, uh, prolong uh, being sitting there as a big uh, nothing uh, why, to, to gain time for the Confederacy. So another and fantastic thing in this period uh, concerning change and how fast change can be, having in mind what I said about before between 1850, uh, 1850 and 1860, how it went very fast regarding the ugly jaws of uh, slavery. And um, now things are going very fast. In, in uh, 1862, Lincoln issues a preliminary emancip emancipation proclamation. And um, you all know it, but I'm going to read it up anyway. Um, anyway, it says here, this is a preliminary one. So you have to see, this is September 62, and this is the preliminary proclamation. That on the first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1863, all persons held as slaves within any state or any designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then henceforward and forever free. So 
that is, um, when this comes out, uh, Frederick Douglass, uh, you have to imagine these two gigantic figures, Lincoln and Frederick Douglass, in this time of this uh, most historic period of the United States apart from its uh, founding. And uh, Douglas writes immediately that he regards this as the most important document ever being issued by a president of the United States. And Lincoln himself said uh, in 65 before he died, he, he himself said that the most important thing he ever did was to issue the uh, Emancipation Proclamation. So here we are, if you can, and immediately this uh, goes with the grapevine to the south. There's all kind of funny stories about people um, are being, uh, do you know about it, do you know about it, and it just goes very, very fast. Uh, actually, uh, Washington T. Uh, Booker, uh, Booker T. Washington uh, describes how his, mother's, his mother and friends around her they begin, some of the Negro spirituals begin, they, they, where most of them are masked, they begin to be more and more courageous and unmask them and be very direct because they are expecting, uh, and it gets more and more intense, that Lincoln's troops will come and free them. Or there goes rumors as soon as uh, Lincoln's gunboats are coming down, we are all going to be free. So... Um, uh, this, this atmosphere is being created. So you can imagine, uh, okay, he has said he's going to do it, but um, uh, it has not happened. So people uh, have been gathered all around in the United States, particularly in the black community, but also all people in the North that are against slavery, to celebrate that this is now uh, going to happen. This is a milestone uh, in the United States, and it's a total turnaround of, uh, of the situation. So I would like Summer to uh, read on page 143 around the um, two of the celebrations um, uh, in Boston. Boston, as befitted a city housing the cradle of liberty, had two mammoth celebrations on January 1st. At the music hall that afternoon, the meeting was graced by one of the greatest rosters of American literary lights ever assembled under one roof. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Charles Eliot Norton, John Greenleaf Whittier, Edward Everett Hell, Francis Parkman, and Ralph Waldo Emerson. The last named opened the meeting with the reading of a Boston hymn which he had completed that morning, its tone of elation is suggested by a typical stanza. I break your bonds and masterships, and I unchain the slave. Free be his heart and hand henceforth as wind and wandering wave. Emerson was followed by music, all of it in a stirring mood and highlighted by Beethoven's Fifth Symphony with Carl Zeron conducting the Philharmonic Orchestra. The second one in Boston, next page. The second one in Boston, they have, uh, it's like several thousand people. Douglas is there. And uh, you have all these famous people giving one speech after the other. And people are getting more and more antsy because they're waiting for the wire to tell this has been done. So uh, people are beginning to get a little bit let down. And what has happened was that Lincoln wanted, this is a very important document, and there was a little mistake in it. So being New Year, then he, before he went to the reception to say hello to all the people with the New Year in the White House, he uh, sent it back to be corrected. So it took a little bit longer than people had expected. So at this other great celebration in Boston, people, as you can imagine, uh, they're giving one great speech after the other, and it's like, when are we going to hear? So. But just as a letdown feeling began to grip the temple, a messenger dashed into the hall, shouting at the top of his voice, It is coming! It is on the wires! This was the moment sublime. Hats and bonnets went up in the air. Three cheers were given for Lincoln. I never saw enthusiasm before, wrote one participant. I never saw joy before. 
the din, the din was terrific. Even proper Bostonians abandoned their reserve for once. <laughs> Everyone was on his feet, each in his own way, giving vent to his pent-up feelings, some by cheering, some by clapping, some by waving their hats, and some by just letting their eyes roll from scene to scene as if to drink all of it in. After things had calmed down, the audience sang hymns of deliverance. First came, Blow Ye, the Trumpet Blow, with Douglas serving as lead voice. This was followed by another piano. Sound the loud timbrel o'er Egypt's dark sea. Jehovah hath triumphed, his people are free. And this last one. This is uh, uh, soldiers on the, the island. Okay. Of the exercises in the South, the most impressive were those held at Port Royal and the Sea Islands. Here, on January 1st, whites and Negroes assembled near the camp of the first South Carolina volunteers at a grove framed by live oaks. Shortly before noon, the exercises began. The preliminary emancipation was read by a South Carolinian, Dr. W. H. Brisbane, who long before the war had freed, who long before the war had freed his 30 slaves. The next scheduled event was the presentation of two flags to the regiment. But as Colonel Thomas W. Higginson reached for the flags, a voice was heard singing the opening phrases of America. My country is of the Sweet land of liberty. Other Negroes quickly joined in. I never saw anything so electric, wrote Higginson. It seemed the choked voice of a race at last unloosed. Another eyewitness was similarly moved. Nothing could have been more unexpected or more inspiring, wrote Army Surgeon, Surgeon Seth Rogers. And this was just a couple of tidbits. There was like electric uh, throughout the South uh, that this had happened. And uh, this also means that the blacks in the North can now enroll in the Army. Lincoln himself writes that he had, and he, sells, he also tells doctors later on when they meet, I had to get the people in the North organized enough so they would accept black soldiers. I could not just kind of just do it. I had to wait until the situation was right. So now it is uh, in Massachusetts, the governor had been allowed, and that's where they formed the famous um, uh, 54th, is it called division? Brigade? Regiment. Uh, Massachusetts 54th Regiment. And uh, Frederick Douglass is extremely excited. He, his, um, uh, he writes article upon article, gives speech after speech to get the black men in the north to enlist in the army. And um, his, uh, he, see, the problem is for Massachusetts, there's not a lot of black men there. So uh, then he helps to get black men for, for the other states. His own son is one, the first recruit that uh, Douglass uh, gets. And um, he writes several um, calls uh, and also arguments. There's a, whole, uh, there's a whole article of nine points why you, as a black man, should join Lincoln's army, one point after the other. And then he has a call that goes out in many, many copies and are being used for a long period called Men of Color to Arms. <coughs> When first the rebel cannon shattered the walls of Sumter and drove away its starving garrison, I predicted that the war then and there inaugurated would not be fought out entirely by white men. Every month's experience during these dreary years has confirmed that opinion. A war undertaken and brazenly carried on for the perpetual enslavement of colored men caused logically and loudly for colored men to help suppress it. Only a moderate share of sagacity was needed to see that the arm of the slave was the best defense against the arm of the slaveholder. 
Hence, with every reverse to the national arms, with every exulting shout of victory raised by the slave-holding rebels, I have implored the imperiled nation to unchain against her foes her powerful black hand. Slowly and reluctantly, that appeal is beginning to be heeded. Stop not now to complain that it was not heeded sooner. It may or it may not have been best that it should not. This is not the time to discuss that question. Leave it to the future. When the war is over, the country is saved, peace is established, and the black man's rights are secured as they will be, history with an impartial hand will dispose of that and sundry other questions. Action. Action, not criticism, is the plain duty of this hour. Words are now useful only as they stimulate to blows. The office of speech now is only to point out when, where, and how to strike to the best advantage. There is no time to delay. The tide is at its flood that leads on to fortune. From east to west, from north to south, the sky is written all over, now or never. Liberty won by white men would lose half its luster. Who would be free themselves must strike the blow. Better even die free than to live slaves. This is the sentiment of every brave colored man amongst us. There are weak and cowardly men in all nations. We have them amongst us. They tell you this is the white man's war, that you will be no better off after than before the war, that the getting of you into the army is to sacrifice you on the first opportunity. Believe them not. Cowards themselves, they do not wish to have their cowardice shamed by your brave example. Leave them to their timidity or to whatever motive may hold them back. I have thought not lightly of the words I am now addressing you. The counsel I give comes of close observation of the great struggle now in progress and of the deep conviction that this is your hour and mine. In good earnest then and after the best deliberation, I now, for the first time during this war, feel at liberty to call and counsel you to arms. By every consideration which binds you to your enslaved fellow countrymen and the peace and welfare of your country, by every aspiration which you cherish for the freedom and equality of yourselves and your children, by all the ties of blood and identity which make us one with the brave black men now fighting our battles in Louisiana and in South Carolina, I urge you to fly to arms and smite with death the power that would bury the government and your liberty in the same hopeless grave. I wish I could tell you that the state of New York calls you to this high honor. For the moment, her constituted authorities are silent on the subject. They will speak by and by and doubtless on the right side. But we are not compelled to wait for her. We can get at the throat of treason and slavery through the state of Massachusetts. She was first in the War of Independence. First to break the chains of her slaves. First to make black men equal before the law. First to admit colored children to her common schools. And she was first to answer with her blood the alarm cry of the nation when its capital is menaced by rebels. You know her patriotic governor, and you know Charles Sumner. I need not add more. Massachusetts now welcomes you to arms as soldiers. She has but a, colored, she has but a small colored population from which to recruit. She has full leave of the general government to send one regiment to the war, and she has undertaken to do it. Go quickly and help fill up the first colored regiment from the north. So, um, as he says, the white man's soul was tried in 1776. The black man's soul is tried in 1863. So, uh, in the summer of 63, Douglas goes and sees Lincoln because it has been promised that the black soldiers will get the same pay, same conditions and so forth as the white soldiers, and this is not taking place. And... Um, uh, Later on, indeed, it is getting reversed and uh, um, being changed. So uh, after this meeting with Lincoln, uh, Frederick Douglass talks about it. And as I said before, he had been really um, pushing and kicking Lincoln and saying exactly what he thinks. Uh, and uh, here they meet, and here's a little reflection 
uh, from Douglas about how this meeting took place. I never met with a man who on the first blush impressed me more entirely with his sincerity, with his devotion to his country, and with his determination to save it at all hazards. He told me, I think he did me more honor than I deserve, that I had made a little speech somewhere in New York, and it had gotten to the papers, and among the things I had said was this, that if I were called upon to state what I regarded as the most sad, and most disheartening feature in our present political and military situation, it would not be the various disasters experienced by our armies and our navies on flood and field, but it would be the tardy, hesitating, vacillating policy of the President of the United States. <laughs> and the President said to me, Mr. Douglas, I have been charged with being tardy and the like. And he went on and partly admitted that he might seem slow, but he said, I am charged with vacillating, but Mr. Douglas, I do not think that charge can be sustained. I think it cannot be shown that when I have once taken a position, I have ever retreated from it. That I regarded as the most significant point in what he said during our interview. So, uh... In August 64, uh, the war uh, from the side of the Union doesn't look good. And uh, if uh, Lincoln's armies do not get some victories, Lincoln will not be re-elected as the U.S. president. So he is very uh, concerned, it's not the right word, but very much on his thoughts are uh, what about if we lose this war, what about all the uh, million, uh, several million of slaves in the South? What about them? So what's going to happen? Uh, what can we do? And uh, so he asked Frederick Douglass to come and see him in the White House again. And uh, he proposed, he says to, to, he asked Douglass, look, could you please set up an agency so uh, that we can see how we can get uh, the slaves out uh, and over to us. Um, and Douglas doesn't like the idea too much, but he, uh, he leaves and then he contacts some of the most prominent black men in the North and uh, he has a proposal of seven steps for such an agency led by him to get the slaves out from the South. But this doesn't become necessary because the war is changing and there's one victory after the other. So it's not necessary to set up a special plan for freeing the slaves because they're going to be free when the war is won and now there is a total change in the war. So uh, Richmond falls and uh, Lincoln is very happy and uh, he decides the day after, this is the beginning of April, uh, he, he decides to go down to Richmond uh, and to, you know, look at the place and say hello to the people there. It has been a very big battle. So uh, he goes with a gunboat down the James River, but it goes aground, and uh, he had to take a barge. It's he, him, his son, Ted, and uh, just a few people. And then they, when they land down uh, in the neighborhood of Richmond, Nobody knows that they are there. And uh, here's what happens. No, not yet. After 24 hours of such miracles, perhaps Richmond Negroes were not wholly unprepared for the coming of Lincoln. As the president stepped ashore holding Tad by the hand, the only persons at the wharf were a group of Negro laborers. Almost at once they recognized him from his pictures. One of them, a man of 60, straightened up and exclaimed, Bless the Lord! There's the great Messiah. I know him as soon as I see him. He's been in my heart for long years, and he's come at last to free his children from their bondage. Glory, hallelujah! The old man fell on his knees. The other Negroes followed suit. You must kneel to God only, 
said the embarrassed Lincoln. The Negroes arose and, joining hands in a circle, began to sing a hymn. As they sang and Lincoln listened, the crowd got larger and larger, coming from over the hills and from the waterside. The alarmed Admiral Porter ordered the sailors to fix bayonets to their rifles to prevent the party from being crushed to death. The Negroes showed no sign of dispersing, behaving as though Lincoln had come expressly to greet them. Surrounded by admirers whose number was multiplying, the captive president realized that he must yield. Holding up his hand for silence, he began to speak. Assuring his listeners that they were free, he told them that it was now up to them to prove themselves worthy of their freedom. This, said he, they could do by obeying the laws and keeping the commandments. The president's brief remarks were received with loud cheers and shouts, after which the satisfied Negroes fell back, opening a path. Followed by an ever-growing throng, Lincoln and his party left the waterfront and walked through the streets that had suddenly become alive with Negroes. Their eyes were riveted on the man in the long black duster and the high silk hat. Many of them could not contain themselves at the sight of him and gave expression to their feelings by shouts, screams, whoops, ejaculations, and body twistings. Many Negroes gave way to the urge to take something off so that, according to spectator George A. Bruce, the streets through which the procession passed were literally covered with abandoned hats and clothing. <laughs> so Lincoln is quite thirsty. See, he takes a little break and then... Lincoln's trip around the city was slowed not only by the fallen bricks which littered the streets of the badly burned city, but also by the mass of Negroes who were bent on seeing him and, if possible, on touching him. On, the, on one occasion, when the party had to make a stop, two colored urchins climbed on the top of Lincoln's carriage and took a downward peep into the president's eyes. All along the way, the Negroes gave expressions to their sentiments. The kingdom's come and the Lord is with us, chanted one woman. I'd rather see him than Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Exclaimed another, trying to get in front of the carriage so that she might get a full face view of Lincoln. Um. A week after, Lincoln is shot. So, um, so this is a big shock for the nation. And um, if you see what had been happening in the, in the 40s and in these years from 50 to 60 and the Civil War, uh, and where now, I mean, the Civil War took something like 600,000 lives, what it also meant, uh, emancipation of the slaves, a total new era, and uh, Lincoln is dead. So I would like uh, Summer again to come up um, regarding reactions to Lincoln's death. This is literally who is in Richmond, and something like seven or eight days later, he's shot. The news of Booth's deed stunned the Negroes of the city. Overwhelmed with grief, many of them walked up and down in front of the dwelling on 10th Street where the dying president lay in the plain wooden bed of a rented room. So um, this next uh, scene uh, is with a woman called Mrs. Keckley had been the assistant to uh, Lincoln's wife. She was a former slave. And when she hears uh, Lincoln's death, she rushes uh, to where he is. As the distinguished looking and stylish mulatto into the guest room where the lifeless form lay in state. The cabinet officers and military commanders broke their circle so that she could make her way forward. Looking down into Lincoln's face, Mrs. Keckley's composure left her for a few moments. Her eyes filled with tears and her throat suddenly became dry and tight. 
She recalled that the last time she had seen Lincoln, he had spoken kindly to her, but her feelings of personal bereavement soon merged into a more inclusive sense of loss. No common mortal had died. The Moses of my people had fallen in the hour of triumph. When her bittersweet reflections had been brought under outward control, Mrs. Keckley filed out of the room, her heart pounding and her footsteps not wholly steady. And the funeral in the procession in Washington? As Washington prepared for the funeral exercises, the city's Negroes went into mourning. Many families went without a meal to buy a yard or two of black ribbon to hang above the door or window. By some means or other, most Negro women managed to procure mourning dresses, veils, and bonnets, while the Negro men faced a lesser problem of obtaining crepe bands for their hats. Such black bedecked colored men and women were among the more than 25,000 visitors to the East Room on Tuesday, April 18th, come to take a last solemn look as they filed past the President's beer. On the following afternoon, the impressive funeral services were held at the White House. Then came the procession to the Capitol where the body was to lie in state. 40,000 mourners were in the line of march following the long black hearse and keeping a slow step to the dirges played by the regimental bands. Marching at the head of the line was the detachment of Negro soldiers, the 22nd U.S. Colored Infantry. And then you know how Lincoln's body is being taken up through a number of the cities to end up in Springfield. Um, here is just a short scene from Philadelphia. At Independence Hall, the head of the coffin was placed near the Liberty Bell. Standing on a pedestal near both was a homemade wreath of fur, which had been brought to the building early that morning by an old Negro woman. As reported in the Philadelphia Press, she had presented it to a guard, saying that it was all she had to give. And I would like uh, Freddie to um, read up three short statements from Frederick Douglass about Lincoln. Uh, the first of them, uh, the first two of them are not so long after his death, and the last one you can see uh, this is where he's older, Frederick Douglass is older, where he looks back and look at uh, the role that Lincoln had played, and therefore he realized that Lincoln's acts and his uh, living had been even more important than Douglass had realized uh, earlier on, looking back in retrospect at history. So this is Douglas about Lincoln after the death. Under his wise and beneficent rule, we saw ourselves gradually lifted from the depths of slavery to the heights of liberty and manhood. Under his wise and beneficent rule, and by measures approved and vigorously pressed by him, we saw that the handwriting of ages in the form of prejudice and proscription, was rapidly fading away from the face of our whole country. Under his rule, and in due time, about as soon after all as the country could tolerate this strange spectacle, we saw our brave sons and brothers laying off the rags of bondage and being clothed all over in the blue uniforms of the soldiers of the United States. Under his rule, we saw 200,000 of our dark and dusky people responding to the call of Abraham Lincoln and with muskets on their shoulders and eagles on their buttons, timing their high footsteps to liberty and union under the national flag. Under his rule, we saw the independence of the Black Republic of Haiti, the special object of slaveholding aversion and horror fully recognized, and her minister, a colored gentleman, duly received here in the city of Washington. Under his rule, we saw the internal slave trade, which so long disgraced the nation, abolished, and slavery abolished in the District of Columbia. Under his rule, we saw for the first time the law enforced against the foreign slave trade, and the first slave trader hanged like any other pirate or murderer. 
under his rule, assisted by the greatest captain of our age and his inspiration, we saw the Confederate States, based upon the idea that our race must be slaves and slaves forever, battered to pieces and scattered to the four winds. Under his rule in the fullness of time, we saw Abraham Lincoln, after giving the slaveholders three months grace in which to save their hateful slave system, penning the immortal paper, which, though special in its language, was general in its principles and effect, making slavery forever impossible in the United States. Though we waited long, we saw all this and more. His great mission was to accomplish two things. First, to save his country from dismemberment and ruin. And second, to free his country from the great crime of slavery. To do one or the other, or both, he must have the earnest sympathy and the powerful cooperation of his loyal fellow countrymen. Without this primary and essential condition to success, his efforts must have been vain and utterly fruitless. Had he put the abolition of slavery before the salvation of the Union, he would have inevitably driven from him a powerful class of the American people and rendered resistance to rebellion impossible. Viewed from the genuine abolition ground, Mr. Lincoln seemed tardy, cold, dull, and indifferent. But measuring him by the sentiment of his country, a sentiment he was bound as a statesman to consult, he was swift, zealous, radical, and determined. Though Mr. Lincoln shared the prejudices of his white fellow countrymen against the Negro, it is hardly necessary to say that in his heart of hearts, he loathed and hated slavery. The man who could say, fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray, that this mighty scourge of war shall soon pass away, yet if God wills it continue till all the wealth piled by two hundred years of bondage shall have been wasted, and each drop of blood drawn by the lash shall have been paid for by one drawn by the sword, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether, gives all needed proof of his feeling on the subject of slavery. One is where, a little bit later, when he looks back at Lincoln. The one man of all the millions of our countrymen to whom we are more indebted for a united nation and for American liberty than to any other is Abraham Lincoln, the greatest statesman that ever presided over the destinies of this republic. The time is too short. His term of office is too recent to permit or to require extended notice of his statesmanship or of his moral and mental qualities. We all know Abraham Lincoln by heart. And looking back to the many great men of 20 years ago, we find him the tallest figure of them all. His mission was to close up a chasm opened by an earthquake, and he did it. It was his call back to a bleeding, dying, and dismembered nation to life, and he did it. It was his to free his country from the crime, curse, and disgrace of slavery and to lift millions to the plane of humanity, and he did it. Never was statesman surrounded by greater difficulties, and never were difficulties more ably, wisely, and firmly met. So, uh, in uh, 1867... Uh, there is a number of so-called Reconstruction Acts. And the late Confederacy are now divided up in a number of military territories. And uh, in the elections, uh, all black men over the age of 21 can now vote. And the white uh, men can only vote if they can take an oath to the Union. Otherwise, they cannot vote. So I have the figures, but I'm not bothered with it. So you had a large amount now in this, uh, of black men that votes. The women did not have uh, the right to vote yet. And, uh, but that immediately uh, after you had, what year was it that the uh, soldiers were taken back? 76. 
Yeah, when the American soldiers are being taken out from the South, you immediately have a reversion of the state of affairs and all kind of nasty tricks with restriction laws and so forth are being used uh, to prevent black people from voting. So that when you have by year 1900, there was almost no vote from blacks in the South. And uh, at the same time, you had other things like in 83, the uh, Supreme Court of the United States declared the Civil Rights Act of 1875 void. And that was a law that had said that had granted equal rights to all citizens on public transportation, whatever this public transportation was. Uh, similarly, Douglas goes down to the South in 88 and he's really shocked uh, what he discovers in the South because, uh, okay, slavery had been uh, abolished, but what you had now was a system set up that was uh, as devilish as before, where uh, a person could eat, uh, could uh, uh, earn eight dollars a month, but they would not. You would not. When you worked for eight for a month, you didn't get your eight dollars. You got like a piece of paper uh, worth those eight dollars, and then you can go and buy what you needed in a store, but only one store, and very often that store was owned by the person that uh, you were employed with. And of course, you know, if you can never have a dollar, you cannot save anything up. If you can only go to one store, uh, then the prices can be arbitrarily high. So uh, the, the throughout the South, Douglas was shocked about the impoverished and horrific uh, situation of the black population. And um, uh, where he describes it has just gone, it had just continued to, to uh, go down. There's you, if you are interested, you can also look, there was some very evil tenant laws where uh, uh, before anything the rent has to be paid, including in advance, and uh, the landowner could go in and grab all what you owned um, uh, in order to get the rent paid, a rent that was also put arbitrarily and so forth. So uh, uh, there's many more things to be said of um, Philip Douglas, but I want, to, I want to end here. I mean, he had a much longer life um, uh, because the most important role, I, the most important thing I wanted to get across was he had these two guys, Lincoln and Douglas, one a slave, one a poor Kentuckian, Americans that then were in the most important period of the United States after the founding, that their pathways merge. And with the, um, after the death of Lincoln, and then uh, 10 years uh, later, it begins to uh, go very much downhill. But we have a situation today, the battle we have on our hands today is similar to the situation that you saw in this period from 1850 to 1860 in the United States. When LaRouche says that this nation could cease to exist, uh, that is a fact. Uh, and now today it has much more horrific worldwide um, consequences. Uh, it is the exact same ideals uh, that are being fought for. The ideas about man and man's relationship uh, to the universe. The ideas that uh, are being fought, that we are fighting for, that the rule stands for, namely the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States, is what is at stake one more time. Uh, the revolution was not won, and uh, you know the beastmen operations and how this is completely trampling the uh, constitutions, Constitution of the United States underfoot um, as we have it today. Therefore, our role, and I thought about this morning when Lynn talked about that among the youth movement, among you here that are, that are collaborating, and youth outside are collaborating with each other in order to uh, uh, improve 
so that we can uh, and get key leaders, people that would take uh, the role of taking responsibility for the nation and for the world in the way that Lynn is doing today and in the way that Douglas and Lincoln was at their time. This is what is necessary today and the crisis is on a bigger scope than it was uh, in, in from uh, 1850 uh, and to the end of the Civil War. That is a similar kind of crisis and it's the, around the same ideas that uh, we are fighting today. So I would like to have the next one. Uh, so we had over here in the uh, we had over there, there was just territories before, right? Uh, but then you can see the similarity with 1860. If you, could, if you had this whole section over there was territory, then you have the West Coast, and you have a certain part of the Midwest and the East Coast, and the rest are Christian fundamentalist, racist, uh, uh, anti-constitutional states. So uh, we have our work cut out for us. Uh, can I have the next one, please? This is uh, the... Um, the old, uh, here's the fighter, a little bit older. Um, and I would like uh, Freddie to uh, read a, a short statement from Frederick Douglass regarding his sentiments as an older man and um, that of what I think with smaller changes are our sentiments today. The real question, the all commanding question, is whether American justice, American liberty, American civilization, American law and American Christianity can be made to include and protect alike and forever all American citizens in the rights which, in a generous moment in the nation's life, have been guaranteed to them by the organic and fundamental law of the land. It is whether this great nation shall conquer its prejudices, rise to the dignity of its professions, and proceed in the sublime course of truth and liberty marked out for itself since the late war, or swing back to its ancient moorings of slavery and barbarism. The Negro is of inferior activity and power in the solution of this problem. He is the clay. The nation is the potter. He is the subject. The nation is the sovereign. It is not what he shall be or do, but what the nation shall be and do, which is to solve this great national problem. And then I'd like Aaron to come up, because um, what uh, I jumped into like 20 times minimum in different speeches, I mean, God is like to sing. And in different speeches and in different uh, articles he wrote, he would always, at least 20 times or so, aside, he would go back and recite from uh, Burns's A Man's A Man and all that. So, for all that. So, I would like, I, mean, I have the text for everybody, and Aaron will decide uh, how, much, how many stances we're going to do and which ones. But I will now give it to you so you can uh, sing too.
<laughs> okay. Uh, some of you guys know this song. Some of you have never heard it before. I think so as to not turn it into a drinking song. I think everyone else can come in maybe on the second to last verse and the last verse. But I'll sing the first three. And uh, I think the beginning thing is kind of fun too. This is from Burns at the top. This a great critic, Atkin, on songs says that love and wine are the exclusive themes for songwriting. This is on neither subject, and consequently is no song. But we'll be allowed, I think, to be two or three pretty good prose thoughts inverted into rhyme. I do not give, I do not give you the foregoing song for your book, but merely by way of Viva la Bagatelle, for the piece is not really poetry. <clears throat> hey, Nick? Zapovich? Hey, A? Is there for honour's poverty that hangs its head in all that? The coward slave we pass him by, we dare be par for all that. For all that, and all that, our toils obscure, and all that. The rank is but the guinea's stamp. The man's the god for all that. What though on hamely fire we dine, Where hoard and grey and all that, Ye fools are silks and knaves are wine, A man's a man afar that. For all that and all that, Their tinsels show and all that. The honest man, though e'er say par, he's king a man for all that. He see on Berkey cut a lard, what struts and stares and all that. Though hundreds worship at his word, he's but a kiff for all that. For all that. And all that his ribbon star, and all that the man of independent mind, he looks and laughs at all that a prince can make a pilted niche, a marquis do, and all that, but an honest man's a fool is me. Phil. <laughs> 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 
Just kidding. Just kidding. No? Okay. Uh, if there's no questions, we can take a... Yes? Okay, yes. Um, you know, uh, Peter had two questions. One, one question I had was, I mean, uh, Jefferson Davis, he was, he was a money president. And he, and he, and he, no, he, they just seceded. All these states seceded, and then they formed the Confederate United States. Right after Lincoln was elected, uh, then they succeeded and decided that they were not part of the Union anymore. And therefore, so then you had this Confederacy, and Jefferson Davis was then the presidency, uh, the president, so Lincoln was the president of the Union, and Jefferson Davis was the president of the Confederacy. But he didn't run like, for the president of the No. Uh, and he was the vice president before, and administration before the I don't remember. He was uh, Secretary of War. Secretary of War in the end of the year. Is that it? I'm sorry. Uh, Oyan? Uh, I have two uh, questions. One is just real quick. What was um, Douglas' uh, credit that had a certain response to the credit taxes? But um, I was also wondering uh, if you could elaborate a little more on these things that you said that were used in Douglas' had. Was that before Lincoln was inaugurated? Not what I, not what I, not what I've been able to find. I mean, except for um, that he calls him in a few times to the White House, and like example, when he's inaugurated the second time, Douglas wants to uh, come to the party afterwards, and he's been sent away in the doorway because he's black, and he said, "Look, tell." tell Lincoln that I'm down here so Lincoln immediately makes sure he's opened up. Actually, Lincoln has a lot of black people coming into his White House. But uh, it's clear that Lincoln keeps an eye. Uh, Douglas is, is the key spokesman uh, in the North uh, against slavery. And he's extreme. If you read his speeches, he's extremely sharp. Um, and uh, therefore, for sure, I mean, for example, Lincoln say, Douglas refers himself that uh, he saw this little speech I gave uh, in order to, uh, they belong to the same faction, so to speak. And several times when Douglas, um, for example, have said, we, now we need the emancipation, now we need this, Lincoln is already thinking about it and already been discussing it with some people, and, uh, but Douglas doesn't know. But um, it also where I have read it is you have all these different, I just made an extra few, but you actually have a number of cases where their thoughts converge, where they have changed the way they thought, either Lincoln had thought or Douglas had thought. And although you had good people like this guy Sumner, uh, you had a guy like, there was nobody that rose up to their stature, like this guy Seward, uh, who was also a Republican, he would give these statements against slavery, but then he would be, he was wishy-washy. He would go for public opinion, and I mean, there was many people that thought, for example, that Seward should have been nominated by the Republicans and not Lincoln, and Douglas said, no, no, I mean, Seward, he should, he should be happy that he's out where he can still stand up because he's a wishy-washy guy, not Lincoln is not like that. So, this kind of, what I found a lot was kind of like mutual education of each other to take up, I mean, which is the same what uh, we should have among each other to, um, in educating us and also regarding with deployment, <laughs> whatever, so we really do the most, change all the time. Hmm? The reason he's, uh, I thought it was, ironical because uh, of the situation we are in today after the uh, re-election of Bush and Cheney where you have such atrocities with the fugitive uh, slave law 
and the great compromise and then Dred Scott, you had like one thing after the other, that it becomes, I thought, for example, it's the same what Lynn has said, now the fundamentalists will really hurt. Now people are going to hurt. And very much, of course, also the people that voted these guys in. Uh, so he says, look, it's getting so bad. I mean, if with other words, doctor says it's getting so bad that maybe this was necessary, just one more in the chain of events. He says there's another, it's just a lot of beautiful things I didn't want to take up. Like he has a quote, which is almost like Linda LaRouche today, where he blasts the blindness of the American people. And how many shocks do we need to give to the American people so they can get this blindness away? Hmm? But also I like it because he never gives up. You know, Lynn says, I'm never going to lose because I'm never going to quit. Well, Douglas was this kind of a guy. Yes? And also, it's fascinating because, I mean, I was a little bit ridiculous because I went back, I've heard it many times, the preamble to the Constitution. And sitting working here over the last couple of days, I also, over in the cabin last night, I took it out and I read it aloud to myself. And then I read it again. And it's all in there. Uh, concerning what the, on which is so beautiful, it's all in there for the good. I and mean, as soon as you be like the general welfare and for our own and for our the, the liberty of poster, our posterity and so forth, it's all there. And as soon as we go away from those ideas, then destruction. There's somebody down there? No? <laughs> 